Hello, friends, and welcome to our program today. I'm Dr. Willie Nutt with San Jose Word of Faith Christian Center. It is always a pleasure to address those that are in our hearing audience. We're going to continue in a message that I began a few weeks ago entitled, A Ministry of Power. A Ministry of Power. Uh, if we could cooperate with the Lord, then certainly there's a lot of things he wants to do with us. Uh, last time I was with you, we talked about being ambassadors of Christ Jesus, which means that there should be a certain endowment in our lives allow us to operate in the supernatural, praise the Lord, and that we should be able to uh, believe the Lord for the supernatural as he promised uh, just before his ascension back in the book of Mark, the 16th chapter and the 19th verse. And uh, I want to focus on the 20th verse there, actually, Mark 16 to 20. It says, and they went forth, referring to the apostles during the time uh, that were there with Christ just before his ascension. It says, they, those apostles, and those who were working with the other disciples that followed the apostles, they went forth and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. And he concludes that by saying, Amen. I thought that was significant. The term amen means so be it. And so that interjection makes it clear that it is God's will for us to go forth and do mighty signs and, and the mighty wonders as his representatives here in the earth realm. The Apostle Paul reaffirmed that, that conclusion that we came to after reading Mark, the 16th chapter and verse 20, that they went forth preaching the gospel everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the what? the word with signs following. Paul comes on the heels of that in 2 Corinthians, the first chapter in the 20th verse saying the following, for all the promises of God in him, everybody say in him, yeah. are yea and in him. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And to the glory of God by us. The word in, uh, in the phrase in him is significant. Although some Bible translators substitute the word uh, through him, saying it is implied. And if you look at the biblical concordance, uh, that is one of the implications of the word in. However, this diminishes the meaning embodied in the phrase in him, because the preposition in is from the Greek word in, spelled in, denoting fixed in position, in place, time, or in state. Y'all get that? The word in means, again, to be fixed in position, in place, in time, and in state. Therefore, the phrase in him refers to all the promises being fixed, praise the Lord, you see that? In and positioned in the Lord. So where are the promises? Where do they reside? In where? In him. So the problem with using the word through is that does not give you the... Uh, understanding that we're talking about the fact that the, the place where the promises of God are resonant are inside of him. It is true that they flow through him, but the point is that where the blessings reside, where the promises reside, are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So praise the Lord. So in order to access them, we must be fixed in and positioned in and living in the Lord, where his promises are. Praise the Lord. It is interesting that the majority of the mainstream Bible translators agree uh, to the pre previous definition that I gave you about the word in when it is contained in the following scripture, yet they differ in the above scripture that I read that was found in uh, the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, the first chapter, the 20th verse. Let me read it again. So here in the King James Version, it says, for all the promises of God in him are yes, in him or amen, unto the glory of God by us. So uh, the, the latter part of that verse says that when we, are, when we receive the promises of God in our lives, that what that does is brings glory to the Father by us. Notice that the promises are in Christ, but by us there's a manifestation of those promises in the earth realm where they become uh, real uh, visible um, manifestations of the faithfulness of God to we who would dare take his word and use them. So that word in that uh, was translated through by many translators in that verse that I just read, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20, for all the promises of God in uh, through him is what they say are yes, and through him are amen unto the glory of God by us. And uh, I challenged that. It, they should stick with the original translation, which is in, in the context of being fixed, because we're looking at where do they reside. Uh, that through does not give you that picture of where the promises actually reside. 
And uh, I make this statement because in Romans 8 and 1, uh, again, it says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are what? In Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. The word in that is used in this particular phrase, in Christ Jesus, in Romans 8 and 1, is the same Greek word that we talked about in 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. The promises of God in him are yes, in him are amen. Everybody's still with me here. So in Romans 8 and 1, again, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Notice here, the focus is on the fact that where do we reside as believers? We rely, we're supposed to reside in Christ. We're not talking about through Christ. We're in Christ, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, in um, this particular verse, everybody pretty much agrees in terms of the translations you look at that it should indeed be in and not the word through, although it's exactly the same uh, Greek word that was used uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 1 and 20. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are through Christ Jesus. doesn't make any kind of sense, does it? You see that? Does that make sense to you? No. We're not talking about through Christ. We're talking about the fact that we need to be in Christ. And we do a lot of things through Christ, but the place where we are positionally supposed to be is in Christ. Most mainstream uh, translations use the word in rather than the word through in Romans 8 and 1 because the word through does not portray the proper meaning. You see that? Which is uh, focused on we who call ourselves believers being where? In Christ. And so, so many people want to play games with, are you in Christ? Are you living in him? Are you, is your residency in Christ or is it somewhere else? And uh, by using the word through, that gives you the ability to go through different juts elsewhere that it's acceptable to the Lord that you not be a position abiding, abiding in him the way you should to receive the bounty that he has for you. The Apostle Paul emulated the charter for the supernatural that just flow through us being in Christ Jesus. Because we're in Christ Jesus, the promises that are there will flow through us and manifest as a real tangible thing in the earth realm. This is what uh, the uh, scripture says here. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 to 5, the Apostle Paul giving us instruction on his position, on where the promises are, and the kinds of things that we're supposed to do as believers. In, in respect to the supernatural. And so he says this in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, verses uh, 4 through 5. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of what power. So he said a number of things here in this particular verse. He said that he wasn't focused on using enticing words, although he was a uh, um, well-educated, a very eloquent man, the Apostle Paul. But he said that his focus is on the demonstration of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Some may call, it, call him the Holy Ghost and of uh, a power. Look at the fifth verse, 1 Corinthians 2 and 5. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So Paul stated that the signature for his ministry was not in great oration and human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power. The word power that's used there uh, in the text is from the Greek word dunamis. Many of you probably have heard me mention that before, uh, the Greek word dunamis. And what it means is especially miraculous power, usually by implication, the miracle itself. It's not just power and ability. The connotation is we're talking more about supernatural ability, not just ability. People have ability. But we're not talking about just ability. We're not talking about certain charismatic uh, modes that people might operate in. We're talking about supernatural potential and power, not potential and power acquired by your own actions, such as going to school, a theological seminary, and learning everything there is to know about the Greek and the Hebrew, and all the historical references that tie into within the, the canon of scripture. That's great and that's noteworthy. We're not talking about something you acquire ex, uh, externally from the Lord. We're talking about something that comes as an importation of the Holy Spirit in your life. Is that clear? So often people don't get, they talk power, power. What kind of power are we talking about? We're talking about supernatural power, dunamis 
ability, not natural ability, not natural power, not natural might, supernatural wonder working power is what we're talking about here and the Apostle Paul is conveying to us. The fifth verse, again, 1 Corinthians 2 and 5, he said that you need to operate through a demonstration of the Holy Spirit in power that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the, what that same word, power of God. So our faith should stand within the supernatural, not in just the natural ability. Dunamis or miraculous working power was not an exclusive right of the 12 apostles, which is another error some people make. They act as though the only people that should operate or should operate today are, are people who uh, were back during the time of Christ. That so we're not to operate as the apostles did. But Jesus, he sort of uh, trumps that idea at the time of his ascension uh, in the, the book of uh, Matthew, the very last chapter there, he says this. He said, uh, we're to teach them, he told his apostles that were listening to him, watching him as he was about to ascend on high. He said, go ye out in all the world and uh, baptize, baptizing the people that you are make converts in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching those converts you know, how to, to observe all things whatsoever I have what? Commanded Amen. you. So basically, Jesus said before his ascension that I want you to baptize the new converts in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I want you to do something else. I want you to teach them to observe by implication to do the, exactly the same things that I've taught you to do. And that's pretty clear, isn't it? Emulate. I want them to emulate the kind of works that you did while you, during your time in the earth realm. And I want it to go on to all of the subsequent generations, as many as the Lord thou God shall bring. Praise the Lord. Peter comes on the heels of that and talks about that. That the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit anointing, is for your children and your children's children, as many as the Lord thou God shall bring. So it's not just something that was available for those believers in the early church, but Peter also made it clear that, I think it's Peter 2, um, uh, second chapter, verse 28 and, uh, and verses uh, 29. Let me read this, go take a check here. Making it clear that uh, the supernatural endowment that they experienced in Acts, the second chapter, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came and baptized those believers that were sitting there, seeking the infilling of the Holy Spirit, uh, baptized them in the Holy Ghost and with, with power. So it's actually um, Acts 2. And I'm going to go to the 38th verse. It says, Then Peter said unto them, those who were gathered there, he said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise, he's referring to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, is unto you and to your children and, um, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord thou God shall call. He's saying this is not just a one-time thing where you see a speaking in tongues, uh, the importation of the promise, the importation of the Spirit, the promise that had been prophesied way back during the time of John the Baptist and fulfilled on the day of Pentecost, that this is a continue on to all the ensuing generations, as many as the Lord thou God shall call. That's pretty clear, isn't it? So that says that what the Lord told them, teaching them to observe all things, whatsoever I have commanded you, that that is to continue until the end of this age. So it didn't go out with the apostles that people have been taught. The scripture contradicts that. Are y'all with me today? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So it's real clear here that we're to emulate the same things the apostles did of old. So when Jesus is speaking here, when Paul is speaking, he's not just talking to the early church, he's also talking so we are here today, that dunamis power, miraculous working power, should be a part of our life as believers today. You know, that song that's out there, uh, that used to be sang quite a, quite a bit there within Christendom, he says, uh, uh, it, it talks about the, if, um, if you never needed the Lord, you sure do need him now, is that song. And I forget all the refrains and the verses to it. But that's a true statement, isn't it? If I ever needed the Lord, I sure do need him now. And I think you always come to that conclusion. Why is it that you say, well, the apostles during their time, they needed, super, they needed supernatural potential and ability, but we don't need it anymore because we have the, the letter of the word here. You know, the, the word has to be activated by the Spirit of God so it can have relevance in your life. So it can be an example to those who are outside of the, 
boundaries of Christianism. So they'll be drawn into the things of God by what they see manifested through your life as his ambassadors, as his representatives here in the earth realm. In respect to that word dunamis power, miraculous working power, uh, it was not something that was exclusive to the 12 apostles. But we hear the Lord Jesus here telling them just again, just prior to his ascension, a little bit more about the importance of the Holy Spirit there. In Acts, the first chapter, verse 8, he says the following. He says, but ye shall receive power, that same word there, the word power there is the word dunamis, meaning miraculous working power, after that the Holy Spirit is what? Come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, um, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. He says, the way that you are witnesses of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is by that manifestation of power that flows through you. The manifestation of the Holy Spirit operating through you confirms the fact that you are a witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he told him that just prior to his ascension, uh, which means that prior to being baptized in the Holy Spirit, we don't have dunamis power. If he's just saved and never have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you don't operate in due to his power. Now, God is sovereign. He can do what he wants through whomever, and he might allow some miraculous feat to take place through you. But in terms of a lifestyle, you're not going to operate in supernatural potential and supernatural power until you have been baptized, until you go through the steps that were laid out by Christ Jesus at his ascension. His apostles, notice this, had gone out by twos and did many supernatural feats and works of the, of, of, of the supernatural. But then Jesus makes it clear that although they were able to do that, they were doing that under the auspices of the Christ Jesus, who gave them a temporary endowment to do the supernatural under his auspices while he was here in the earth realm. But he's telling those same apostles now to go into Jerusalem and to tarry, that's what he says in the early part of that verse, of Acts, the first chapter, those chapters just before uh, we read this verse here, that's the eighth verse, he, he says that to tarry until you receive power from on high. So that meant that the, the, the power they operated in, the dunamis power they operated in, was not power, that's something that would be resident in them to be invoked whenever they needed that there be a manifestation. But it was controlled by Jesus who imparted that to them in twos and whatever, whoever, whatever other group of people went along with him as he went from house to house declaring the things of God during the sojourn of Christ. Those supernatural manifestations was done by an endowment of Christ by virtue of the fact that he was here. But as far as when it's his, once his ascension took place, he makes, it clear, he makes it clear that it's not sufficient just to say that you're saved, but you need to go to the next level and have yourself filled with the Holy Spirit with the, the, with the sign gift of speaking with other tongues as the Spirit gives utterance, just as they did on the day of Pentecost in Acts the second chapter, in order for you to be his witness, in order for you to operate in power wherever he might lead you, in Jerusalem, Judea, and as he said, to the uttermost parts of the earth. Praise the Lord. Is that clear? The Apostle Paul uh, indicated that the Lord's expectation for all believers is for them to receive the Holy Spirit anointing so they can operate with supernatural power because when he met the proselytes, the followers of John the Baptist, he asked them this question. So this is a few years after John had expired, but he had made an indelible impression on his individuals. So he had followers of his that even existed during the time of the Apostle Paul. So in Acts the 19th chapter, verses 2 through 7, we see the Apostle Paul addressing them because they're deficient. They have not been baptized in the Holy Spirit, although they were already saved. And let's look at the scripture and see what it says, see what it says here in Acts the 19th chapter, verse 2. It says, he said unto them, the Apostle Paul speaking to the followers of John the Baptist, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believe? The word Holy Ghost is synonymous to the word Holy Spirit. If you look it up in the Greek, you'll see both words there, ghost and here spirit. Uh, modern people usually use the term spirit in reference to the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. And then the Holy Ghost is a term that's been around for years, but we're talking about the one and the same being, the third person of the Godhead, the almighty Holy Spirit, is also addressed as the Holy Ghost. They felt that that is not sophisticated enough, so they moved over to the Holy Spirit. Uh, and both of those renderings are accurate, if you look at the Greek. You with me here? So if I say a Holy Ghost, who am I talking about? 
the Holy Spirit. He's not an it, he is a personality in the Godhead. There are three that bear witness in heaven. Uh, in 1 John 5 and 8, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are what? One. So the Holy Spirit is not an it, he is deity, just as much deity as the Son, whom we call the Word in his deified form, and the Father himself. That's clear. Y'all have that? Amen. Do you have it? Yeah, praise God. Acts 19 and 2 again. Apostle Paul speaking to the followers of John the Baptist. He said unto them, have you received the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit since you believe? Since you believe. Since you believed in the teachings of the apostle of, of John the Baptist. Watch this. And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. Look at the next verse. Uh, Acts 19 and 3. And he said to them, Paul speaking, uh, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, unto John, unto John's baptism. So these people responded to the question that was posed by the Apostle Paul. He's asking them, what baptism were you baptized in? And he said that we were baptized in John's baptism, which was a baptism of repentance. Watch this, look at the next verse. Then said Paul, John, referring to John the baptizer, if you want to be accurate, uh, verily baptized with the baptism of repentance. See that? saying unto the people that they should, and John said this to the people, that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ. So what did John teach? He taught them that there would be something, another individual coming after him, and that once he leaves the, the landscape, that they are to begin to believe on that individual that will follow him. The actual text is given in Matthew, the third chapter, the 11th verse. Let's hear directly what was stated by John the baptizer, John the Baptist, as many people refer to him. Again, uh, Matthew, the third chapter, verse 11. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. These are the words of John the Baptist. But he that cometh after me, who is he referring to here? The Lord Jesus Christ is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So who is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit and with fire? Who is he? The Lord Jesus. So that's what Paul is referring to here. He's saying that uh, um, John the Baptist referenced the fact that there's a different baptism other than the water baptism that's going to come uh, uh, when the Lord Jesus Christ uh, comes on the scene. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who take away, away the sins of the world in the book of John. So he, he, he acknowledges the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lamb. And he is the one that, is, that he had been the forerunner to, uh, to make his way straight, to pave the path for uh, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus, who would come into the earth realm. So here we see him looking at the Lord in person. And I didn't continue in the script that's found in Matthew, the third chapter, but if you continue, you'll find that not only did he acknowledge the fact that Jesus would baptize in the Holy Ghost and with fire, but he also baptized him in water. Watch this. And after he baptized the Lord Jesus in water, he said, uh, the Spirit of God descended upon him like a dove, praise the Lord, signifying the fact that he had been baptized by the Spirit of God at that particular moment. From that day forward, Praise God, he operated in supernatural power. Praise the Lord. Without boundaries. Is that clear? Y'all have it? Amen. I know that's a lot, but I need to compress it so you can get it. Acts, the 19th chapter. Let's go to the fourth verse here. Continue with the discussion here. Then Paul, uh, then said Paul, John, referring again to John the Baptist, or the baptizer, he verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which, who should come after him that is on Christ. So the proselytes of John, unlike many today, they were obedient. Here Paul tells him, look, John told you that you need to go beyond what you've done. Salvation is great, but you need to go to the next level. And we have those that fight all in every way they can to say, I don't need to do this. Uh, but watch this. So the proselytes of John were not resistant to the word, for the following scripture says in um, Acts the 19th chapter, verse 5, the Apostle Paul still speaking here uh, in reference to this, when they heard this, the fact that they needed to have an additional baptism besides water baptism. Let me stop here. Water baptism does not baptize you in the Holy Ghost as is taught by some denomination. There's not one scripture, not even any implication that says that. 
being immersed in water is being immersed in water. And uh, the, if you just look at it from an analytical position, uh, the element into which you're being immersed or submerged is water. Okay, the agent that's performing that is the minister of the gospel. John is not talking about that. John was a minister of the gospel. He was the agent. And the, the environment to which he was uh, emerging them, a submerged, and we're baptized means to submerge completely, to completely whelm, which means to, to completely cover. So when he baptized those individuals in water, they were not baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's why he says that he that cometh after me, the latches of his shoes, I'm not worthy to stoop down and unloose. He, the agent, the Lord Jesus, shall baptize you into what element? Into the element of the third person of Godhead. You shall be immersed into the Holy Spirit. So again, the element to which we are immersed, baptized into, whelmed, praise us, submerged into, praise the Lord, y'all stay with me here, is the Holy Spirit himself. You see that? So Jesus will take us a subsequent act after we've confessed him as Lord, and he will take us, those who are already saved, and he will baptize. He, he the agent, the Lord Jesus, will immerse us into the element of the Holy Spirit. He will whim, completely submerge us in that. So it's a different baptism completely from baptism in water. So just because you got baptized in water does not mean you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in water by a minister of the gospel. Then the other baptism. He said we're baptized in the family of God by one spirit. I need to go there because there's just so much confusion. It doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be. We never forget the dogma. Forget your denomination. Stick with the word. Man's ways of doing things, they, they never last. The nominations are here. Then they go and get tweaked and all that. I don't want that that's going to get tweaked every few years. Let's go to something that's going to stay the same. I'm going to go to 1 Corinthians, the uh, uh, 12th chapter. Let me read this to you. Let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians, 12th chapter, down to the 13th verse. Let's make sure we have clarity here. The Apostle Paul is speaking. For by one spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, are we baptized into one body, whether we be Jews, Gentiles, whether we be bond, or whether we be free, and have been all made to drink unto one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Now watch this. People get so confused on this. Pastor said right now, baptized into uh, the family of God by one spirit. But let's look at it. So, for by one spirit are you all baptized. So who is the agent here that puts us into the body of Christ? The agent is who? Is it the Father? No. Is it the Son? No. Who is the person in the Godhead that baptizes us into the body of Christ? It is the third person of the Godhead. Paul said it right here. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. Let's look at it. For by one Spirit, capitalized, and that's right, by implication, the Holy Spirit, are we baptized into what? The body of Christ. So where, what element are we baptized into? What element are we immersed into? What element are we whelmed into? What element are we uh, submerged into? We are submerged into the collection of believers called the body of Christ. Who inserts us into the body of Christ? The Holy Spirit touches your heart draws you to the things of God, allows you to receive Jesus as Lord, and once you receive him as Lord, the Holy Spirit then takes you, the new convert, and he takes you and he immerses you in the body of Christ. He makes you a part, a member of the body of Christ. He makes you a child of God. Praise the Lord. Are you with me? It makes you the son of God in the sense in which you received him as your Lord. Again, who's the agent the, that's performing this? It is the Holy Spirit. What is the element into which he puts you once you confess Jesus as Lord into the body, the collection of believers? And then once he does that, he says, so I can identify you as belonging to me. I'm going to give you a drink of my spirit. So the Holy Spirit said, open your mouth, your spiritual mouth, open that up. Then he takes a part of himself and he pours it and you drink it and you swallow it. So he said, now that will identify you as belonging to the Lord because you do have the Spirit of God in you. 
but you do not have the Spirit of God in you in full power. Full power comes when the Lord Jesus takes you and then immerses you, not giving you a drink, but puts you down and submerges you in the Spirit of God. That's why I said he's filled with the Spirit. Filled with the Spirit, baptized in the Spirit are synonymous when you look at it in Acts, the first chapter, when Jesus gives us some insight in terms of what those things mean. Isn't it clear now? There's water baptism. The agent is a minister of the gospel. The element to which you've been immersed, completely overwhelmed, not sprinkled, but immersed, is the water. That's water baptism. Baptism in the family of Christ, Holy Spirit is the agent. He takes you, he puts you, inserts you in the body of Christ, a collection of believers. He pushes your head down inside. Let me give you this illustration. All the more, he just pushes you down. Okay, now you're part of that collection that we call the body of Christ. The agent, Holy Spirit. Where did he put you? In the body of Christ. What did he give you to identify you as a child of God? He gave you a drink of himself. He didn't fill you. He gave you a drink. There's a vast difference between drink and then being completely immersed, you with me, in that element. You were not immersed in the Holy Spirit then. You were given a drink of his spirit that identifies you as a child of God. So you're limited in what you can do. Then uh, John, uh, the baptizer, said back again in review. <laughs> In the book of Matthew, that he that comes after him, the Lord Jesus, will take you, the agent is Jesus, and he immerses you in the Holy Spirit. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. So there's two things the Lord Jesus does. He puts you in the Holy Spirit, and that fire, the connotation of that is the purifying fire that is in the presence of the Lord. The agency that brings conviction, the agency that keeps us clean, that's a part of the nature of the Holy Spirit. But also the empowerment comes from the Holy Spirit. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So there's power and then there's a purifying fire that attends you once you've done everything you're supposed to do as a child of God. That's why you won't be doing things you're not supposed to. You won't be cussing nobody out. You won't be sleeping with a, a spouse that's not your own. You'll follow the laws of the land to the best of your ability unless they contradict the things of God. You with me? You live by what the Bible says and not by what you say. Mm -hmm. You will conjure up things the scripture does not support. You with me here? Mm -hmm. So you will be a truly a Christian. That's enough on that. Amen. Amen. I don't know how else to go beyond that. That's pretty clear, I thought. Y'all thought that was pretty clear? Yeah. I don't know how you're missing it. You just want to. A lot of people want to. Let's look at the next verse here, and then we'll move on. Um, Acts the uh, 19th chapter. And uh, Paul, in his dealings with the uh, proselytes, the followers of, of John the Baptist. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the followers of John the Baptist, the Holy Spirit came on them. And he told them what John had said. They believed what John had said. They permitted Paul to lay his hands upon them. And the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Till the Holy Spirit, praise the Lord, um, they were immersed in the Holy Spirit and began to, to speak in other tongues. Through the hands of the Apostle Paul, the Lord Jesus took those individuals by faith and he immersed them in the element of the Holy Spirit and they responded by doing what? By speaking with tongues and prophesying. All the men were how many? Twelve. Seven verse. First step towards operating in the supernatural, the title of the message in continuation is a ministry of power. That's why I'm going through this. We told you the source of power is the Holy Spirit. And the steps necessary to get to a point where you can operate in power. Was that clear? Mm -hmm. The first step towards operating in the supernatural is receiving the baptism in the Holy Ghost. Or in the modern vernacular, receiving the Holy Spirit in power. This is the component that's missing in a lot of the so-called Christian churches. They don't teach their people. You need to go beyond just confessing Jesus as Lord and going through water baptism. You need Holy Spirit baptism to operate in supernatural power. And uh, I'll say more about that momentarily. I will just interject it now. Once you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you have the responsibility to build yourself up on the most, your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You need to continually pray in the Spirit, pray in tongues, uh, speak in tongues to keep your inward man built up. Are you hearing me here? Because you're in your world, the virtue... Power is released, sometimes even sucked out of you with the challenges you encounter. 
It needs to be replenished. The way we replenish is by praying in tongues, praying in the Holy Ghost. Amen. The book of Jude builds you back up to where you're supposed to be. I'm just going there quickly. Somebody's listening to me today who's confused. You don't need to be confused. Just listen to Dr. Nutt. We'll get rid of, we'll dispel the confusion. No reason for us to go that way. Jude, let's go to the book of Jude. The book of Jude, we'll go all the way down to the 20th verse. But ye, beloved, watch this. Jude, the half-brother of Jesus, one of his half-brothers. But ye, beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. How? Praying in the Holy Ghost. You see that? Now, question said, people said, well, I pray in the Holy Ghost. Well, I don't know any other way you can pray in the Holy Ghost other than praying in tongues. What about you? How, how would you know? I'm praying in the Holy Ghost. Well, are there times that you're not praying in the Holy Ghost? You got other times I'm not praying in the Holy Ghost, so I'm just praying in English. I'm praying with it out of my head. And I may start out the prayer that way. I think I got a problem because I just lost my job. So naturally, I'm going to pray that the Lord gives me a new job. That's what's in my mind. I need a new job because I need income. My house mortgage is due. My car payment is due. And he said, in all our ways, acknowledge you and you'll direct our paths. I'm going to start off in the natural. And I'm going to pray in English. And because I'm baptized in the Holy Spirit, I know not how to, even though I think I know, I know not how to pray as I ought, but the Holy Spirit's going to intercede. And he's going to speak in the language of God on my behalf. Are you with me here? So as I'm praying in English about what I think the problem is, the Holy Spirit comes and says, that's not the real problem. The real problem is this. God allowed you to lose your job because he wants to give you a better job. And so we, want, we need to reorient your thinking so that you begin to see things differently. We want you to get, come out of the laurels. Quit talking about that old 25 years you spent there. They ain't going to kick you to the curb in a year anyway. They're going to lay you off. They're going to lay the whole staff off. And they're going to leave you high and dry. They're not going to even give you a gold watch like they used to do. And uh, they're going to do just like they did Dr. Nutt. When it's time for him to retire, fortunately, he, he was able to retire on time. They didn't give him a gold watch, but they gave him, at least they gave him a grandfather clock. But the grandfather clock they gave him, which he has in his house right now, he's had for about 20 years since he retired. Uh, that clock is about one-fourth the size of the clocks they gave up to the time that he retired. That big, huge, it really was a grandfather clock for those who preceded me. That would go from almost the ceiling all the way down to the floor. That's what my predecessors received. But by the time it got to me, I had a miniature version. It sounds good, it looks good, but it's nothing like a big old huge grandfather clock, which all predecessors got. And then you know what? The group of people who dared to wait and didn't leave when that window was there, they got zero. They didn't get no watch. They didn't get no grandfather clock. They got a kick in the seat. They didn't even give any departure money at all. Just get out of here. So listen, the Lord let you get fired if you're a child of God so that he can redirect you. And so as you're praying in English, Lord, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You're praying. All at once you say, I'm gonna, I need the Holy Ghost to help me start praying in tongues. And the perfect prayer is prayed on your behalf. And then God can do something supernatural by directing your thinking, have you call somebody, and do something that will open up that window that you couldn't see in the natural, so you begin to see things supernaturally. So, oh, now I understand why he let me lose my job, because my friend knows somebody that's got a better job, and my skills are a perfect fit for that job. Thank you, Lord. Then you start praising God because he opened, because your head was in the sand. You're so used to working for those people for 35, 40 years, 20 years, that you, you never took time to look at the landscape to see if there's anything better. So he had to mess up, shake your apple cart so that you look differently, think differently, and give him an opportunity to bless you and the Holy Spirit to pray through you the perfect prayer to lead you and to guide you into all truth whatsoever he's commanded you and to show you things to come. Let's talk about that in more detail. Do you get that? So how do you pray? How do you pray in the Spirit if you don't You've never been baptized in the Holy Ghost. I don't know. That's an impossibility. No one, I've asked this question for those who don't subscribe to speaking in other tongues. And I ask, okay, tell me how you speak. Tell me how you pray in the spirit. How is that different than you praying in the flesh? How would you know? I know because I know all the ones, I, I speak with tongues as the spirit gives me an utterance. There's a prompting in my spirit and it's the Spirit speaking through me. He takes control of my tongue, begins to articulate things that I hadn't formulated, and formulate words that I don't even speak. That's how I know it's the God's, this Lord speaking through me and not me speaking to myself. Amen. That's enough on that.
Is that clarity? Somebody got to declare it. Y'all got it? So the first step in operating in supernatural, we want a ministry of power, we want a life of power, uh, is receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Or in modern vernacular, uh, well, yeah, I said it, Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, whichever school you're from. Mm-hmm. Observe, that the Paul, observe that Paul implied that the followers of Jesus, John the Baptist, were already saved because they believed John's teaching, saying they should believe on him, listen to this, this uh, which should come after him, that is on Christ, Acts 19 and 4b. So John taught them to believe on him that should come after him. So he said that's tantamount to, to being saved. He that believeth on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be what? Saved. Shall be saved. You see that? So John the Baptist told them the formula for being saved. They believed on the teachings that he gave them in reference to Jesus, the Messiah that would come after him. But they just hadn't been endowed with supernatural potential. They had not been uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. However, Paul indicated that there was a subsequent endowment they needed beyond salvation, and that was uh, the receiving of the infilling or the baptism of the Holy Ghost. The word infilling and baptizing are synonymous, if you look at it, in Acts, the first chapter. That is made very clear. I don't have time to get into it today, but in your leisure, just read it, and you'll see what I mean. Praise the Lord. So if Paul indicated that the followers of John the Baptist, who believed in the Lord Jesus, that they required the subsequent endowment, which was for them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is synonymous to being uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit. We who are believers today also need the Holy Spirit in baptismal measure. Therefore, the text says in Acts 19 and 6 again, and when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spake with tongues and prophesied. The Apostle Paul believed in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power, giving the following as the reason, saying in 1 Corinthians 2 and 5, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God, in dunamis power, supernatural power. So once the Lord has done a number of supernatural feats, then you begin to really believe. You know, and it, the Lord has confirmed his word through what signs following. You just get one or two miracles and you become a, a genuine believer. And you believe that God can do anything. And so when all hell breaks loose in your life, then you begin to call upon the Lord to help you. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Psalms 34 and 19. I didn't tell you that once you get baptized in the Holy Ghost, you're not going to have any more problems. You're going to have hell and high water. But you have a tool whereby you can deal with all those things that the Lord permits to come against you for your development as believers and for his glorification. Because once you go through that challenge, you have a testimony that will attract others into the the kingdom of God. The only way we can track people is by what they see God do through our lives. They watch you get blessed. They watch you get the job. They watch you get healed, still alive. The doctor says you're going to die in a year. And 20 years later, you're still alive. Then they begin to believe. Oh, my God, they begin to believe. God is who he says he is. That's his hope for them. There's hope beyond the intellectual mind, hope beyond the people that they know and the context they have, which are fleeting, praise God. And as you get older, they just, they all die off. Your mentors die off. And you start getting my age bracket, the people that was, went to college with you and high school with you, a whole bunch of them are dead. My wife went back and began to look at those who went to high school with her. The group was a huge group there in, in Fresno. And uh, a school that's known all over the U.S., especially back in that day, back in the 60s and time frame, the late 60s, they were known for basketball and track. You know, you talk about uh, the school she went to, Edison was the name of the school at that time. They had some significant uh, athletes that came out of there. It was a predominantly black school she went to, and that's the way it was in that day. And uh, they went back to their reunion, they had re- actually a reunion about 10 years ago. The number of people remaining, I think it was under 15, 15 to 20. Some of them they couldn't even find. Some of them they believe died in the Vietnam War. But it was such a small number of people, they didn't have enough people to have a, a reunion. They had to combine with other classes because just about everybody had died off. Y'all hear me? Same thing with my class. I'm a little older than my wife. I went back to a reunion in 2004. 
And in terms of black folks, now there's a few more white folks there. In terms of black people, there's only two there. The rest of them, most of them, they didn't know what they were. And some I found out had died in the war. And, and some of them died from various kinds of incurable diseases. They didn't fare well at all. Most of them struggled in life and just gave up. It's just a handful. And there, I think, two or three people were there. All the rest of the people that were there, we had enough to have the reunion, but all of them pretty much were Caucasian people. Now, I'm just saying this. Everybody needs to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. But if you're black, you sure enough need to get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm just going to tell you like it is. You can play all these mind games you want. I don't care how many degrees you have. There is discrimination. It's going to be here until Jesus comes. I know other people won't tell you. I'm going to tell you. I've been out there on both sides, manager, developer, director. I ain't talking outside my neck. That's what I know. I've been in the closed door where they decide who's going to get the promotion, who can get the raise. I know what's said. And I can surmise what's said when I leave and they go to the bar because I can see the results the next day or the next week. If you're going to make it in this world, you need in any minority, especially Hispanics and blacks, you need the Lord on your side. You want to fare well in this world and definitely in the afterlife. You need the Lord. You need to get saved. You need to submit your life to the Lord. You ain't smart enough to outwit Satan, the archon that's been around for thousands and thousands, from the very inception, from the beginning. He was there when the Lord formulated you and created the first man. He is right there watching. You're not going out with him. Praise the Lord. You need to get saved, and then you need to be baptized in the Holy Ghost so you can live in power. Praise the Lord. When challenges come, you have an assist to stand alongside with the paracletus, the almighty Holy Ghost standing with you in opposition. That's the, the context of that word paracletus in the Greek is one who stands aside with you in opposition to those things that oppose you. And there's a whole bunch of opposition that's coming against people today. And when he comes, when the opposition and Satan and his agents come against you, you have the almighty Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, empowering you enlightening your mind, directing your steps to navigate the landscape, to come to a position of success and a place of victory so that as an ambassador of Christ, Father God can get glory out of your life. If that's not good preaching, I don't know what is. Praise the Lord. Y'all get that. <laughs> no, listen to me. You know, if you've been here, it's a milk toast doctrine. They ain't telling you the truth. Just come on over here to the doctor now. You can look at our television program. We'll actually... Uh, we, we, you have our, um, so, some of our broadcasts, we give you the address. Others, we actually tell you what our, where our website is. Just go to our website and find out where we are. So you can come to a place and you can get the full gospel. I mean, if we don't have church, let's have church all the way. Let's declare the whole counsel of Christ Jesus. Let's not play around and go cut this verse out and cut this. In fact, there's some Bibles, that, the verse I read in Mark, the 16th chapter, do you know there's some versions of the Bible that don't even include the part that talks about supernatural manifestations? And they play a lying game. I hit this in an earlier session where, you know, this is not in somebody else's older text. But in the same translation of the Bible, you look around, you find they included things that have, that's not in the text that they said uh, merits them cutting out the 16th chapter of the book of Mark. Let me just leave it alone. Praise the Lord. Y'all with me here? So they're, they're not, they're not uh, truthful and honest in what they do. So... You need to have the Holy Spirit in the leech and guide you. We're going to say more about that momentarily before we conclude today. Uh, the question that comes to mind is how did the early church govern themselves? We're going to talk about that just before we come to conclusion. One of the major problems in Christendom today and many mainline uh, denominations is that too many, much credence is given to human intellect and wisdom and philosophy. The Apostle Paul admonishes us saying, our faith as believers should rest on the power of God. I thank God for the New Testament. How many of y'all do? Because during the early church, there was a number of years before the Gospels were written, a lot of people don't know this, and the letters of the Apostle Paul and others, which constitute the New Testament, didn't exist. According to New Unger's Bible Dictionary, the New Testament books in our present New Testament canon may be dated from the Council of uh, Laodicea about A.D. 363. 363 years after Christ died. Does that give you a perspective? And Carthage, about 397 years after Christ died. It means all of the New Testament canon were not in place and accepted by those who were in the know and highly respected people until about 397 years after the death of Christ. A.T. Robinson, he comes in. He's a lecturer in theology at Trinity College, Cambridge, 
a well-respected scholar, believes that all the New Testament books, and uh, actually what I saw there, the Gospels, not all of them, were written between A.D. 47 and 70. So the minimal amount of time, actually, if you continue, he thinks that the book of Mark may date as early as A.D. 45 and Luke, within 10 to 15 years after that. Matthew, at least uh, by A.D. 70. So Matthew, he didn't believe, it probably existed by A.D. 70, 70 years after Christ had died, meaning that it wasn't available in a form that people could use and live by for 70 years after Christ died. And John, prior to the fall of Jerusalem, which occurred around 70, uh, 70 A.D., during the siege and the occupation of Roman, the Roman general Titus. Y'all heard of him, right? The fall, rise and fall of the Roman Empire. Actually, he was part of that contingent, but then they came into Jerusalem and they plowed it, like plowing a field, because the Jews kept acting a fool under their, uh, the Roman um, subjugation. They wouldn't do what they're supposed to. So they sent Titus in there, and he just totally destroyed the temple and everything else, uh, 70 AD. So the point I'm making here is that John, St. John's book, was not available until about 70 AD. And the minimal amount of time was about 47 AD, so uh, 45 AD, so they didn't have nothing to read. So what did the disciples do for the first 45 years? You know, you know, is that a good question? So how did they know what to do? Okay, I'm going to jump to it right now. We'll come back and give you some more detail. But I want to leave this thought with you. Uh, the Lord Jesus answered that question. We're going to come back to some other things you need to know. But today, because of the time that remains, I want to at least leave this in your mind. In St. John 16, 7, verses 15, 7 through 15, we're going to read it. The Lord Jesus is telling us what they did in order to know how to be led in, uh, in life's issues. Since they didn't have the gospel, the gospels were not there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they didn't exist. And then the book of uh, Paul, uh, they didn't, because Paul hadn't even gotten saved yet. So his books didn't exist either. Peter's books, all those books, they didn't exist. So the question is, how were they led? St. John 16 and 7, Lord speaking. I am telling you nothing but the truth. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. When I say it is profitable, good, expedient, advantageous for you that I go away. Because if I do not go away, the comforter, who is the counselor, helper, advocate, intercessor, and strengthener, stand by, the third person of Godhead, uh, will not come to you um, uh, into close fellowship with you. Amplified Version. But if I go away, I will send him to you to be in close fellowship with you. And when he comes, he will convict and convince the world and bring demonstration to it about sin and about righteousness, uprightness of heart, and right standing with God. Some people don't want to talk about. And about uh, judgment, about sin, because they do not believe in me, trust in, rely on, and adhere to me. That's what it means to believe. Uh, about righteousness, unrighteousness uh, of heart, and right standing with God. Because I go to my Father, and you will send, see me no longer. About judgment, because the ruler of this world, we're almost finished, Satan is judged and condemned, and sentence already uh, is passed upon him. I have still many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them or take them upon you or to grasp them. But when he, the spirit of truth, uh, the true Give it, truth giving spirit comes, he will guide you into all truth, the whole full truth, for he will not speak of his own message on his own authority, but he will tell whatever he hears from the Father, the Holy Spirit, is listening to the Father, he will give you the message that has been given to him, and he will announce and declare to you the things that are to come that will happen in the future. He will honor and glorify me because he will take, uh, receive, draw upon what is mine and reveal, disclose, uh, transmit, and declare it unto you. Everything that the Father has is mine. The word mine is from the Greek word emos, and what it means is of me. That is what I meant when I said that he, the Spirit, will take the things that are mine of me and will reveal, declare, disclose, and transmit it to you. Now, let me just say this again. I read all of this. The essence of this is that the Lord Jesus is telling us how the early church survived. He said that the Holy Spirit will lead you and will guide you into all truth and will bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have told you and will show you things to come. That's how they lived. They prayed in tongues. They listened to what the Spirit of God said. 
the Lord gave them revelatory information through prophetic words, through interpretation of tongues, and they did it right. They had other people there with them to make sure it was interpreted properly, let everything be done decently and in order. When the prophets speak, let them speak by two or three, and that by course, the one to hear and the other to, to, uh, to judge, similarly speaking in tongues. Somebody speaks in tongues, there should be someone, especially in the church, there should be someone there to interpret what they say and to judge to see if that word is correctly. Are you with me here? So that's how they live, it's praying in the Holy Ghost, Praise the Lord, allowing the Holy Ghost to prompt them and direct them in the steps they should take. They also have the Old Testament verses, the Bible says, which was God breathed. So they have the Old Testament and they have the Holy Spirit. That's how they govern their lives. God bless you, my friend. Until next time, we'll probe that to greater depth. I want to leave that in your minds. Go with God. This is Dr. Willie Nutt. Until then. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog, or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.